Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Penn Faulkner's Literary Conversation Series. My name is Beth Ann Patrick, and I'm the Penn Faulkner Board Chair for, for Programs. And I'm so excited to welcome you here for our spoken word presentation. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Penn Faulkner is a literary nonprofit organization based in Washington, DC, with a mission of celebrating literature and fostering connections between readers and writers to enrich and inspire individuals and communities. We fulfill that mission by administering two national literary awards, the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story, as well as through our education programs, which bring free books and author visits to DC public and public charter schools. And of course, literary conversations like this one. If you'd like to learn more about the work we do, please visit our website at penfaulkner.org and follow us on social media as well. Before I introduce and bring on tonight's amazing panelists, I want to mention a few quick technical notes about the webinar. There will be live captions provided this evening. To turn captions on and off, you can use the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There will also be a brief Q&A session at the end of the event, so you can submit your questions using the Q&A button also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can upvote favorite questions and we'll do our best to get to the ones that you vote for in the time we have. Very important, you'll find our panelists books on sale through politics and prose, through links we'll put into the chat. So it's time to get this conversation started. And to do that, I am honored to introduce tonight's panelists who have joined us from around the United States to talk about spoken word poetry and how it forms part of the literary landscape today. We have four panelists. Fatima Asgar is a writer and filmmaker. In 2011, they created a spoken word poetry group in Bosnia and Herzegovina while on a Fulbright studying theater in post-genocidal countries. They are the writer and co-creator of Brown Girls, an Emmy-nominated web series, a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellow. They were also featured on the 2017 Forbes 30 Under 30 list. They are the author of If They Come For Us, One World 2018. They are the co-editor of Halal If You Hear Me, an anthology that celebrates Muslim writers who are also women, queer, gender non-conforming, and or trans. Welcome, Fatima. Thanks for being here. Our next panelist, Olivia Gottwood, has received international recognition for her poetry, writing workshops, and work as a Title IX compliant educator in sexual assault prevention and recovery. Originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, she now lives in Los Angeles. Olivia is the author of two books of poems, Life of the Party and New American Best Friend. Her debut novel, Whoever You Are, Honey, is scheduled to be released in 2023. Welcome, Olivia. Dunez Smith is a Black, queer, pause writer and performer from St. Paul, Minnesota. Dunez is the author of Don't Call Us Dead, Gray Wolf Press, 2017, winner of the Forward Prize for Best Collection, the Midwest Booksellers' Choice Award, and a finalist for the National Book Award, and Insert Boy, Yes, Yes Books 2014, winner of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award and the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry. Dunez is a member of the Dark Noise Collective and former co-host of Versus with Franny Choi, a podcast sponsored by the Poetry Foundation and Post Loudness. Danez's third collection, Homie, was published by Grey Wolf Press in January 2020. Last but not least, welcome Danez. Nate Marshall, our moderator tonight, is the author and editor of numerous works, including Finna, Wild Hundreds, The Breakbeat Poets, New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop, and the audio drama, Bruh Rabbit and the Fantastic Telling of Remington Ellis Esquire. He teaches creative writing and literature at Colorado College. Nate was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Welcome and thank you so much to all of our panelists for this evening. So glad to have you here. Hello, hello. Hello, Nate. Here. Thank you, Bethan. You're welcome. I will leave it to you now. All right, appreciate you. 
Cool. Hello, Zoom folks out in the Zoom world. Um, I guess the chat is off for you, or I'd ask you where you are coming from. Uh, but I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado, so what's up to y'all uh, from somewhere by some mountains? Um, <laughs> wonderful. So, you know, I'm really excited to have this conversation uh, with this really wonderful set of writers and writers who have really had a chance to observe and just be be fans of and in community with uh, for a number of years. Um, so I think that maybe just before we get really into the conversation, it makes sense um, to uh, to to just read a little bit, right? So maybe if we can just sort of open up this space with a poem or two uh, from each person and then we'll, we'll kind of come into the conversation. Um, so Fatih, Fatima, would you would you be willing to to open the space for us? Yes. Um, thank you uh, for having us. Thank you, Nate, for moderating. Um, thank you to Penn Faulkner for having us. Um, let me, oops, that is the wrong document. So let me just take a second to get the right one. Okay. They're in their Lord of the Flies bag. Terence says about the boys nestled in the mouth of the waterfall, the one boy's eyes to the sky, legs wrapped around the rock to keep him alive, afloat, the river running over him, kissing him just so, his body an interruption in the water, the rush and roar of its call, partitioned by the fall, dividing it from itself. The other boys perched around him like water nymphs, staring off beyond the dip in the mountains where the sun sets. The boys so landed, they become part of the land, the roots rooting around their ankles. Yes, in their lorded fly bag, but a lord of the flies before it gets dark, before they do what they do to Piggy, before the split and hunt, wild still, Boys who jump from high where the trees are into the water cradled so lovingly by rock. Boys who ford the river in their sock, throwing the sho their shoes to any soft land willing to catch. The water, a mother, both healing and scolding, both soft and gathering pressure around the fall. Shallow enough to walk, deep enough to dive. The boys know her like their own where to step and where to not, how to say hello, when to let her sleep, their big toes scraping into the moss to hold them steady, fingernails finding the hook between roots to anchor, to pull their bodies upwards, the coquis coquiing their song, the sun winking its set, everything green, nothing poisoned, alhamdulillah, to know land so well, you can play with it, to never second guess where your foot lands, how to get your body where it wants to go, to be so from you, from, alhamdulillah, to cradle the fall and not fall, to hear the rivers rush and feel safety, wild, the boys, in their lord of the flies bag, yes, the boys there on top of the waterfall, the boys, wild, but not lost, the, the boys wild and belonged. Um, and then this next one I'm gonna read is a short section from my novel that's coming out in the fall. Um, and the only thing you need to know is that there's three siblings. Um, uh, Kosa is the youngest, Aisha's in the middle and Noreen's the oldest. My fingers wrapped in Noreen's hair as she runs and I bounce on her back. Across the street, Aisha howls, weaving, backpack dangling lightly off of one shoulder. In this world, we were born into nothing, but everything is ours. The sidewalk, the yellow markers in the road, the rain falls through the leaves and kisses us just so. What no one will ever understand is the world belongs to orphans, that everything becomes our mother. We're mothered by everything because we know how to look for the mothering, because we know a mother might leave us and we'll need another mother to step in and take its place. The tree, mothering its shade, 
the restaurant door props slightly open, mothering its smell of cookies to us, the blinking walk sign holding on long enough to mother us across the street. And like how the sun was made just so it could mother Noreen, so it could warm her skin, the sidewalk made to mother Aisha's knee so it could kiss it when her body hits the pavement, a love strong enough to leave a mark, the rain mothering us faster home, the hallway birds mothering their cages, the hamster mothering its wheel, all the mothers in the world reach out to the motherless. And beneath me, Noreen was made to mother me, her heartbeat pounding against my back, shouting so loud that it fills my entire being. You're held, you're held, you're held. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. So what I have, okay, that brought up a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll write them down, put them in my, in my pocket. Um, and maybe next, uh, to continue to sort of open this space, Denez, would, I, would you be willing to bless us real quick? Yes. Um, cool, cool. Good evening to everyone out there. I'm checking in from Philly. All right. Um, I'll read, I think, some new things. Um, this one's um, called Ars Poetica, until I find a more exciting title. There is no poem greater than feeding someone. There is no poem wiser than kindness. There is no poem more important than being good to children. There is no poem outside love's violent potential for cruelty. There is no poem that ends grief, but nurses it towards light. There is no poem that isn't jealous of song or murals or wings. There is no poem free from money's ruin, no poem in the capital nor the court. Most laws reword a double script. There is no poem in the law. There is no poem in the West. There is no poem in the North. Poems only live south of something, meaning beneath and darkened and hot. There is no poem in the winter, nor whiteness, nor any poem, nor are there poems in the landlord's name. No poem to admonish the state, no poem to free you. Hands do that. Guns, flames, love. All right. Um, and then second thing. Um, Let's see, that's the wrong thing. That's work. That's also work. This is the work. Okay, here we go. Um, this one's an evolving poem. So it's gonna end what will later be the middle. Um, but I'm writing this poem a little bit at a time. It's called Color Study. Newport green, micro braid honey. Not blood red, but the red of the blood. So bandana red bang red, brimson. First Sunday white, purple like the flavor, kinky twists like sun flares on the stoop. My love says I look terracotta, thank God he's never called me chocolate. Pink tongue around a cherry proof, black as time, black as tomorrow, nipple brown, gums blue, yellow snow, smoke like a, like a smoke in a dark room taupe, white as smoke, blue smoke, blue flame, and my homegirl vomits four piece brown all over the dumb thick one's glass heel and the red velvet floor, apology blue, green as basil, green as sour diesel, brown water, brown people drink, brown water, brown, brown black white no green green for blue a red and dangerous mind blueprint white as hunger around a mouth red as history gray as a book stolen plum whale white blue eye brown eye up to god god black god blue with eyes everywhere eyes brown blue and yellow blue and yellow blue and yellow only no black no black blue and yellow blue and yellow blue and yellow only no black no black the green Green of quitting the smoke, the blue sm piece of the blue piece of smoke, the blue distance from fire, blue being black and golden at 6 p.m. 
being black in the embrace of water, oh, yellow and fake wreath your joy that won't wither and would poison when chewed, oh, yellow, red and all beautiful poisonous things. Teach me red and orange stripes down my back. Teach me blue crown around my eight eyes, brown of the roaches that depressed spring, ancient brown of stone, they, can't, they are. Roaches live forever, forever must be beautiful. Roaches, the color of God, God, the color of the tulip past duty, the color the color of the coffee's wealth, the color of bark in my mind, the color of autumn's wonder, the color of my favorite hands, and the suddenness of my lover come morning. Amen, breakfast, star, uh, amen, 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 break light, not breakfast. Um, well, shout out to breakfast though. Amen, break light star that halts me, that halts me sunless morning. Amen, yellow and red, my fate, my heavy foot's master. Amen, red eyes all day, looking and looking in the mirror and seeing the dead end, the color of change. The color of wanting to change is my skin. Brown is me. Under the sun I avoid. Upon the grass I need. Green as what I ran from to live. The green chain around the tra uh, the green chain around the trachea. The green uh, the green cage of my mind I convinced myself was peace. The wet light on my face I convinced myself was love. Wasn't even want was need and easy routes was the red indifference of loneliness I needed I needed to be filled and so caught uh, and so caught men of any color the white body of most drugs no more what does the sun look like when my eyes aren't red read red red by the moon in the clarity of 3 a.m I stripped down to ivory and red meat asking each blue god for newness gods god whoever placed the rainbow after the rain give me the strength to separate my yesterdays from my tomorrows give me my, my give me my black mind washed of the caulk and blood dear god after water dear water i don't want to be cleaned i want to drown and be reborn the clean slate of the first fish to dare air i need that trading my blue world for the blue above that bleeds pink during my favorite hours blue possible of morning blue hope of yesterday's death blue yes of now blue like the robins hungry tomorrow and maybe this this time, my red wings won't burn. Yeah. Okay, I see. Honestly, I'm still tripping on Brimson. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was outstanding. That was hilarious. Uh, thank you, Denise. <laughs> uh, wonderful. And last, but most certainly not least, um, Olivia, would you would you open us? With yeah. A little bit? Thank Hello. you. Hello. Um, Thanks so much for having us. Uh, I'm gonna read a sh short poem for my first book and a, another poem for my second. Um, Jordan convinced me that pads are disgusting. They make your panties smell like dirty bike chains, she said. We were sitting on her mother's plastic coated floral couch, one of us in a swimsuit, the other sworn to layers. The water was her selling point and I was terrified of tampons or rather terrified of the undiscovered crater, the muscle that holds and pulls and keeps and sheds. She said, I'll do it for you. And yes, we had seen each other naked many times. We had showered together and compared nipples, wished to trade the smalls and bigs of our respective bodies. So it wasn't unnatural really when I squatted on the toilet seat and she lay down on the floor like a mechanic investigating the underbelly of a car. With plastic syringe in hand, she wedged the packed cotton into me. This is what I saw last before blacking out and collapsing onto the tile, Jordan, blood scholar in a turquoise bikini saying, now you are ready to swim. And this is a poem I wrote after I saw um, Sam Sachs tweeted many years ago, something along the lines of love is a cult. And I felt that deeply. So this is a poem after that tweet, the lover as a cult. And I am humming in an ankle length cotton dress, hanging sheets to dry on a thin wire. A group of girls with swollen nipples braid each other's hair while you watch nod and direct their fingers over and through, over and through. Even the memory of their muscles must be unlearned and retaught by your singular touch, how to hold a spoon or crack an egg. We are sitting on the cusp of spring, 
We are always sitting on the cusp of spring. I remember what it was like to be them, the girls, pungent and ripe and apologizing for every audible movement, but also looking out at the infinite tongue of a middle America highway and feeling joy. I don't know what happened. Maybe the only reason we fall in love is to see what we look like to someone else. I remember when I first came here, you told me the laundry was my duty. You said you liked how precise I was with cloth, praised the way I hung and folded. I developed an affinity for bedding. And after the night of drying, we would unclip the sheets from the line, lay them out on the field, make love and fall asleep in the breeze all before even going inside. We never had any clean sheets. It was our favorite joke. Soon you stopped caring and I lost purpose. I waxed and waned into a cup of bitter tea. I have started to meditate on all of the other things I can do with a sheet, how I can twist it to be rope or drape it over my sitting body. When you told me that you admired the way I scrubbed a toilet, I heard everything you touch becomes new. When you told me to kill the chickens, though I had never so much as swatted an insect, I practiced wringing my own ankles. I am afraid that outside of here is just another here. I'm afraid I will spend the rest of my life hoping to build myself in the vision of someone else. What am I if not yours? What do I do with my hands when they're just hands? Thank you. Damn. That's a, that's a yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try not to cuss. That's the last line, though. Yeah, good, good deal. Um, you know, I will say this. Um, may, maybe this is just a good <laughs> question to. Uh, okay, I can feel free to cuss. Look, you don't want to tell me that, so you know, such a lot. But um, <laughs> I'll help. A you question. Me. There it is, my nigga. All right. <laughs> I'm thinking about this for all of y'all, right? Because I know. You know, obviously, right, like I'm familiar with y'all's work, um, you know, yeah, for it, what, at least about 10 years deep for, for every single one of y'all, right? Um, but I'm curious what, you know, I, I'm certain that, that you, you started doing sort of uh, poetry gigs and features before you, you know, released the first book, and maybe you were working on it at that point, but you know, I think about both of those things as a, a kind of curation, a kind of putting together a collection. And so how just could you talk about the similarities, the differences, like what skills are really applicable, what what things you had to sort of train yourself into um, just in making. I don't want to say transition because I think that's sort of trite, but but, you know, but in, in thinking through the the differences of those kinds of presentations. I mean, I, I think what immediately comes to mind is just how much being a poet, whether doing features or whether like in a slam on a team or just individually requires you to think so much about um, what the audience is receiving, right? And their emotional journey that you're sending them on. And that is very, I feel like that has remained very true um, throughout the curation of a book, especially when like a poetry collection that's not like always like I get I think all of my things are like about a thing but not always about the same thing and so there's always like this emotional arc that I'm trying to chain its way through and that feels very similar to thinking about like what is the last poem that you read at a at a reading right when do you do the funny poem in a slam um you know trying to like you know play on it really is emotional manipulation just trying to play on people's emotions um and I think that feels like a very transferable skill because you're already used to like sort of seeing the work that you're curious and like you know that you're about um and then thinking about how do I invite somebody else into this right um and how do I um set somebody best to be affected by this work right um and so that feels like and like you know and I think that's a privilege because I think it made it made that idea that somebody was on the other side of a book much less scary because I was already used to people on the other side of a mic. I think that um, there's a, a way that uh, when you when you are so used to being when you're on a stage I think obviously that's like 
a, a very scary thing for a lot of people, but it becomes more scary, the idea that someone, that you're not in control of the way someone receives something. Um, and so in performance, it's like you're, a, a large part of your tool is your voice and your, you know, enunciation and, and just your presence. I mean, like the poem is living in your body. And so it, there's this like, there's this way that it becomes personal, that it's more personal, I think, even in a relationship with a viewer. But when it's in a book, I remember just being really like afraid of the idea that someone was experiencing it without me there. Um, and so the, what, what used to be the, the body as a tool and the voice as a tool became thinking about a visual presentation on a page. So if my voice isn't, isn't there, how can I translate something? And of course you only have so much control as you do even when you're on stage. But um, I think that for some of us that, that were maybe came to writing through spoken word or through slam, I never like learned about line breaks. I was like writing just full paragraphs in a journal, you know? And so it was really, um, it was a whole other education in, in performance in its own way, um, thinking about the, the way a poem is written on a page and how that affects how a reader might perceive it. I think also um, there's like a, you know, there was a thing about like reading poems out loud and you could, you could feel what was working and what wasn't working by doing that. It was kind of an extension of an editing process in, in, in a way because you would bring a poem to an open mic or to a show, to a feature, to a high school um, classroom and you would hear instantly where the dead space was. Like you could hear people's attention wavering <laughs> from your poem if it was not good enough, you know? And so, I, and then you could hear where the, like you, and you could just catch the natural, um rhythm of your line and so much like I think in the um is it the art of the line that there's this really beautiful gray wolf series like the art of and I think in the art of the poetic line um it's it's like the the line is like an extension of breath like it's like the idea of like this is where the, this is what you're training the reader a little bit for for the breath um which is I think a really beautiful meditation on like breath work on poetry on presence and on what we some of what we do when we think about the line um and so for me you know I think there was there, there was also this thing where I at the time that I wrote my first poetry collection I was a teaching artist and I worked in high schools in Chicago I needed poems that kids were going to listen to without knowing anything about me because no high school motherfucker gives a sh like a fuck about your bio. Like you come in and you, they're like, I don't care. Like, you know, and they're basically like, are you going to entertain me or not? And are you going to hold my attention or not? And so for me, there was this thing and the, you know, and they're mean, they're like, give a mustache. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> they're so mean, you know? And I think that there's this way in which um, you got, you just kind of got to like roll with the punches. My mustache wasn't lined up, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, you just have to roll with the punches a little bit. And I think that um, you have to win them over. And I think that's the thing is you have to learn how to win them over. And for me, I kind of think of myself as like, I want to get bogged down in an image like I kind of go towards like I have this kind of tendency to become unintelligible you know and I think for me working in high schools were and coming up through spoken word and slam was a real desire and a real need to become legible and to become intelligible to so many to my students who I love right and to be like I'm and to my family who I love right and to be like I want I want you to understand me. So how is this an extension of understanding? And I think then in terms of crafting the novel, I mean, sorry, crafting the poetry collection as a collection, there was also the idea of how do we create that understanding on a narrative, on a narrative spectrum in 
a poetic form? Like, how am I doing something that's building an arc, even if it's not narrative, but building an arc, an emotional arc, a an arc where one poem informs the other, where um, you're learning as you're growing and I'm winning you over or bringing you in little by little bit. And then I'm able to kind of earn my right to do weird shit as the book progresses, right? And so to me, I think that was... Um, Th those were where I saw a lot of those overlaps and, and then able to bring in poems that I don't normally read out loud and bring them in into the poetry book in a way that was like, cool, this is going to be in here and, and kind of earn that right a little bit by what they were sandwiched by and what I was giving the reader. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I'm thinking now um, about some of the things that, that you were just saying, Fati, about the poetic line and this and this notion of um of the line as sort of analogous with breath. And then, you know, and, and Olivia, you kind of spoke to this as well when you were talking about the the line break as being something that like when you come up in the sort of oral tradition, like that's not a thing that you necessarily have a relationship to at least as the quote unquote line. Certainly you have a relationship to, to the breath or to like a statement, right? Or to an image or, or what have you. Um, and so I, I guess to that point then, when you move to the page, right? When you move to producing books, whether they be, um, you know, books of poems or novels, right? Because at least two of you all are, you know, have novels that are forthcoming, which we're very excited about. Um, how does how does that yeah th does th does that sort of thing of the breath still still take place and also i guess like what does the page open up for you right like like what what can you do on the page that is either impossible or or more difficult for you to do you know in in performance i i think that um with I think that I, I I had this like there was something at first that felt really restrictive about the page um but as I started working on the page more and moved further um I not further from spoken word but further from slam which are obviously very different things I found such freedom in in not having to write uh strategically or write um like within these strange like arbitrary <laughs> uh ideas like is this a three minute long poem like um you know and so there was this way that I, I just felt a freedom to write to to let stories be as brief as they needed to be um to let stories be a, a thing that people can sit with versus something that is being used in a competition or as some kind of currency and um and i think slam specifically is like taught me so much so much and is and i'm and i'm so indebted to but uh it was this it was just so freeing to like i realized how many stories also there's a really loud harley davidson outside of my house i don't know if you can hear it that person clearly has a huge cock um but anyway I uh, I realized how many stories I had um, not been telling because they weren't like something I could put into a three minute long slam poem. Um, but uh, yeah, I get I lost my train of thought because of the Harley, but that's it. that's it for now. <laughs> um. I love those thoughts, Olivia. Um, when you were talking before, I was thinking about my uh, a professor of mine in college who like was the first one to pose that difference between page and stage for me. He like, I think the words were, are your poems only gonna be good when you're around to read them? And that fucked me up. Um, Cause I was like, maybe they're not. Um, but I think what we have that transfers well to the page, Nate, is a sense of, and Fatih's I think spoke to this, but a sense of, like just emotionality and I and really what it comes what I'm thinking about is duende of like we know um with practice on the stage you kind of write a line and like there are certain lines that are like not that tight but if you say it well enough people will like it 
but then you kind of know instinctually after a while be it in spoken word and slam when you write something you're like that's gonna make the people go fucking crazy right um and so that sense of moving a crowd and just like which comes you know learning that immediate response that comes with performance um that I think transfers well to the page you know there is a sense of like that I feel like I feel bad for people who just like write on their own or just like without an audience and then just start sending their shit out into the world. How do you ever know if you move somebody, you know? Um, and so I think that was a big trust that like, okay, I know how to make somebody feel a thing. Um, but I think what pays off more on the page is that there's a different, you know, certain emotions have certain currencies in performance, right? Um, and I think there's um, a different type, there's a type of quietness that, I think sometimes is um, better articulated on the page um, or in performance that is like lengthy, right? I think like it's also thinking about like how like long, but I don't know how like, you know, poems get longer. Maybe they approach drama. You can do other things that you can't trust within like the confines of what is typically spoken word and slam. There's other types of sentences that you can do on the page too, right? I think like, um, that was a frustration, I think, like with slam um, or with spoken word in general is that sometimes there's really creative writers who just the way they play with language isn't rewarded on the first listen, right? Um, and so there's something about the static pace of the page that somebody can continue to look at. I think Olivia was talking to this. Um, that is different than like, just like that one time through listening thing, right? And so you're able still with armed with that ability to move somebody, now you're able to play in language in a different way and able to trust that your reader isn't, you know, listening to things going on in the room, that they're focused, that they have an attention there as well. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of like, yeah, the page stage thing. Yeah, I really love both those thoughts, Olivia and Dinez. Like, I feel I really agree. And I think that the that thing of like, when you're rewarded on the multiple read, like that, that I love that kind of thought you were saying, Dinez, about like, and, and there's poems I return to and I reread and I get something new every single time I reread them, you know? And there's like the poetic forms that people use, the way that people are, are do things. Um, and I think that that they're kind of secrets, like, and they're preserved secrets that you get to go back to, and you get to, you get to like enjoy. And and you know, there's things about. I think that I can be a visual um, writer in the, in the way that I approach the page and I do form play on in poetry. And to me, there is something about the page that can can hold something that. Um, that is different, you know, and can be enacted in kinds of performance, but that is its own rendering of that. You know, I think about, for example, um, they, they, this is true for screenwriting, which is, I think, a form that pretty much everyone in this chat does, and, or sorry, in this group right now, the four of us all do, but, you know, when you write, and this was the biggest mindfuck when I first started, for me, screenwriting was, I was like, oh, like, this the thing you write it's not um it's the blueprint like it's not the thing you know it's you write the thing you put all your effort in you do all of this stuff but it's not actually the thing and it changes so much and then the directing happens and then there's pre-production and that's one one thing one movie one one vision of the movie production which is another vision of the movie and then editing which is the final vision you know and so there's kind of this element that I that I was like that to me feels very similar to performance it's like you write the thing how we write it like Olivia was saying like oh I wrote it like you know in my journal like a paragraph chunk and then how you perform it every single time gives a new kind of life a new kind of memory to it a new kind of texture and ability for it and I think it's like the blueprint a little bit, you know? And so how do you have the blueprint also be the integrity in its own integrity, right? How do you have it be both a blueprint and in its own integrity? And I think about um, the, if you guys ever get the chance to see the screenplay for A Quiet Place, it's so fascinating because it's really its own, it's like a blueprint, you know, but the, that whole movie is, ain't nobody say shit that whole movie. <laughs> And so the way that the, the 
you know, the, the movie is and the pacing is and how it is, it's a visual document, you know, as much as it is a movie. And I think that that like, that's the blueprint that allowed that thing to happen. And it's a really amazing study on what, um, what a, something on the page can look like in a different form. And I think about that, like, you know, there's people who, um, like, I think about, sorry, I'm talking so much, but I think about like Ilya Kaminsky, who's an incredible poet and on the page, it's, it's so stunning. And then hearing Ilya read is like its own spiritual experience. Like it is so deeply profound. The first time I ever heard Ilya read, I like, me and Denez were sitting next to each other and we both just like wept for like, we, I was like, I was not prepared for that. Like, you know, and there is nothing that Ilya's poems are incredible and they cannot capture what Ilya reads like. You know, they cannot, it's not the same thing. And so to allow both of those things to have their separate integrity, I think is so important um, because I think all of that, they are their own mediums. They are their own integrities and they inform each other, but, they're, but they are distinct in that way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I've, I've, a lot, I've been writing notes and I have a lot to kind of think about, but I do want to, maybe just ask a couple of direct questions um, to each of you. Um, so Olivia, I was, you know, I, I read both your books, uh, both the books of poems, Life of the Party and New American Best Friend, right? And they certainly feel to me like, like two sort of complete collections, but they certainly bear some relationship to each other. Like they, they do have a kind of shared DNA. And so I'm just curious, was that, did that process feel did it feel discreet, like, oh, this, I am working on this book and now I'm working on this book? Um, or was it a little more blurry than that? And also like now, you know, you have this forthcoming novel. So has, what has that process been like in relationship to those two? Um, thank you for reading my books. Uh, I think um, between, you know, there, there was a, there at the time, I don't know if it's this way anymore, but at the time, there was a lot of distinction when I when I wrote New American Best Friend. There was a lot of distinction between the chat book and the full length. That was like a thing, and um, and I and I I guess New American Best Friend is a chat book, and so I remember like feeling like there was this having a personal anticipation for like the day I would like had written a full length collection, and so in some ways, New American Best Friend feels kind of like a younger sister or something to Life of the Party. I think like. Uh, you know, there's there's ways that New American Best Friend has a certain innocence to it. I, I think it, um, I think I had just like lived less when I'd written that book. Um, by the time Life of the Party happened, I was, I was not just, I hadn't just experienced more, but I was also just like at a more advanced stage in processing my own life. And so Life of the Party, I, I think, you know, even now, like, I'm very proud of that book and both of those books but it's funny because I go through phases where I identify with one more like I identify with New American Best Friend a lot more in my life right now than I do with Life of the Party um and maybe that's because I'm on Zoloft I'm not sure but well but it's it's you know it's it changes and but I think for with with fiction and I'm I'm really curious to hear your your how you've navigated writing a novel Fatima because it's like I feel like I just both have utilized the skills that I've gained from poetry but I also feel like I had to learn how to write again I just have I, I had to like learn the all the rules to this entirely new craft it, I it was so it's the hardest thing I've ever done and um, partially just because there's so many words. There's just so many words. There's just simply so many words. Um, and, but, you know, I think it, it's becoming really clear to me that sto sto certain stories, whether they're fictional or not, I think um, beg for a specific form. And sometimes they can live in multiple forms, but I do feel like, uh, I, the New American Best Friend and Life of the Party were both the memories that I needed to tell as poems. And the novel feels like um, kind of a, 
an investigation and a meditation that I needed to tell in a longer form. And then screenplays are, you know, as Fatima said, is like, it's, it's this whole other thing that's ultimately really collaborative, which writing a novel or writing poetry is not. Luckily with poetry, if you come up in spoken word, you do have experience with collaboration on slam teams, but um, it's just wild how vastly different they all feel. And it's, I think with the two collections of poetry, it's become, it's an interesting relationship to now be safe behind the door of fiction. And in, I feel so exposed looking back at my collections of poems um, and feel like, oh my God, like I can't believe that is all out there. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think New American Best Friend and Life of the Party didn't feel like too big of a jump. They did feel like a pretty easy transition. It was the jump to, between genres that felt like, holy fuck, like this is a whole new ball game and I'm a terrible writer, which is not true, but feels true um, when you've been doing yeah. poems for so long. I feel, I feel like to your point, when you start to write fiction after having such a home in poetry, and I think this particular kind of, this sort of tradition of spoken word, which often demands an eye narrator that is very close to one's self, if not just indistinguishable from oneself. When you make that transition to fiction, you're like, yo, I was really just out here snitching on me. Why am I out here telling on me when I could talk about my character? Um, yeah, Fati, I'm curious, um, if, if, yeah, if you have thoughts about this sort of transition between genres uh, that, that Olivia sort of posed, but, but then also, yeah, and, and you know, and this is, you're sort of stepping into a new genre, so what's exciting for you there? Yeah, I was thinking about what you're saying about like, oh, I'm snitching on myself in poetry, and I kind of feel like I'm snitching on myself by being an artist. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter if it's fiction or not, it's just like, there's such deep things that these things touch on. And there's a real kind of like vulnerability in the process of excavation. Like there's a vulnerability in being able to say like, this is, even if this is a character, it's a character that came from my mind and it's been with me. And um, now, you know, now I'm showing you it, this person, you know, making their mistakes and tracking their life everywhere. Um, I think that something I've been thinking about is um, genre as relationship. And when I think about that, I think about the fact that I've been in relationship with poetry for like 10 to 12 years. Um, and so that is a different tenor. There's a different tenor in that relationship. There's moments where I'm just like, I need some space. <laughs> from you, you know, um, or like, we're not fucking right now. And we need to be in therapy, you know, um, because that's like, there's some shit, you know, and um, my, my relationship to the genre of screenwriting is five years. Um, my relationship, so poly, it's like kind of wild how poly my life is on <laughs> um, my, <laughs> my relationship to directing is about three years old and my relationship to fiction is about three, three to four. Um, and so to me, you know, and these are all long-term relationships. Like they're very long-term investments. I I'm with them every day. I'm in this engagement every day. I'm, I'm in it. And yet there's still newnesses and there's differences and there's things like that, right? And so thinking about the both and when I first started writing screen, I, for screen, I kept being like, well, it's just writing. Like it's, there are both writing, you know? And there is the truth in that. And then there's also the vast difference of, of what it means to not be. And yet, even when I write a poem, you know, every time I come to the page, I'm startled with the feeling of, I don't know how to write a poem. Like I'm just startled with the awe in the honest of not knowing. And that, that thing of like, this could be a failure, like this could not work, you know? And um, I think I feel that way with pretty much all of the genres, you know? And with fiction, you know, in particular, the, I think that um, sometimes for me, a poem, I can kind of feel if a thing is a poem or wants to be a poem, 
um, if it feels like it's, it's, it's a slowing down of a moment, if it's like a, mo a thing that is a kind of singular moment or feeling that I can really slow down, you know, and, and be in and luxuriate in. Um, when something is, because I also still think my poems are very investigative. I think, I think the book, my, my book, If They Come For Us was in a, like a very deep investigation of um, generational trauma and uh, history and the way that that manifests. I could feel it physically manifesting in my body without fully the language and then started to touch on what is this pain? And then that pain started to come out in different, um, thank you, Nate, um, started to come out in different poems, you know, and in, 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 in that very deep historical interrogation. I think the same thing though about screenwriting and I think the same thing about fiction and this book of fiction that I'm, I'm going to release in the world feels very vulnerable to me like it's a very very vulnerable book and it's vulnerable for several levels it's vulnerable because I don't you know it's a newer genre to me and so I feel new with it and I feel um like there's that kind of oh my god I'm putting out something that I'm not I don't have like a very long backing in and I don't have a very big community in and I'm, I, this is the thing that I've been writing and it's it's personal so it, even though it's fiction and so it feels um it's a lot about an interrogation of orphanhood and it's just really you know it's really interrogative in that way um and I think with fiction there's this kind of and screenwriting there's elements of narrative that you don't have to contain in poetry so in poetry you can kind of you know, you, you can have one off, so you can kind of, you can have a project book, but you could also not, you know? And I think with fiction, there's those things of like, if you make an edit in the beginning of the book, it ripples through the whole book. If you make an edit in screenwriting on in page five, it ripples, you know? That's even harder when you're doing, when you're writing a TV show and you're going across multiple genres. Like, I cannot tell you the amount of times I, I was in a writer's room where we would have to, we would change something about, the pilot and inevitably the entire thing would change and it would be it would seem like an innocuous change in the beginning and then you were like oh it ripples it ripples it ripples it ripples right and that kind of tracking is not necessarily something that you have to do when you're creating a poetry collection even though there's a different kind of tracking and so I think for me that there's some of that right the genres kind of lend themselves to requiring a different different parts of your mind especially when you're harnessing a narrative project that's over multiple pages. You know, when you're harnessing a narrative project that's over 300 pages of fiction, when you're harnessing a narrative project that's over 60 pages of screenwriting, you know, over X amount of episodes, you're, you're really kind of getting into something that's a little bit different and you're spending more time with character and character arc, you know, whereas in, in the poetry can be so much about the interior, even though it's also about the world. Um, there and there's characters in your poems and there's character there's personas but it's not necessarily um, you know it's not it's not necessarily the same thing as that kind of long form tracking yeah I mean it, it makes me think about like almost like different the, the way that different kinds of travel functions right like if you have a train you can you know take out a cart you know put it somewhere else and more or less like, you know, if the structure, if like, if it has fuel, it'll run, right? It'll go down the track, but you can't like take off the wing of a plane, you know, it starts to, it's, you know, and, the, and it feels like the long form thing is more the plane where the whole thing is kind of dependent on the whole thing in this way. Um, you know, Dinez, I was thinking about this, uh, this most recent book, Homie, um, you know, which is such a book um, it's, you know, especially, <laughs> especially considering this thing of, that Fatih was saying of sort of genres or, or as relationship, right? This is really is a book of relationships, right? It is a book that is sort of chock full of that. And so I'm curious, like, what relationships sort of shape your, um, how you come to the page, right? To write, to edit, and, and or sort of set another way, like, who are the kind of homies that populate your world when you step towards the page, right? Whether they're real or imagined or historical folks, ancestors. Yeah, it's like, who are those people and, and, and what are those conversations like kind of internally? Work. Um, so I think there's a couple folks that come immediately to mind. One, um, 
is my workshop groups from Cave Canem because I think I've learned um, that was just one of the most foundational, not foundational because I was right, I've been right for a little bit, but just the most like every time I went to Cave Canem, I felt like my work increased and pivoted um, or focused that I had a, a greater control over what or greater articulation of what I was trying to do, which let me also try more things. Um, and I think the amalgamation of all those voices just sounds like Eric D. Matthews, um, brilliant poet. Um, but yeah, it's, know, let me close this. This is becoming loud outside. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that Eric D. Matthews is the voice of Kavi Khan in my head. Um, also, the Dark Noise Collective, which Fatih and Nate are in. Um, I think just like having like grown for the last. 10 years uh, with y'all, uh, you know, I think like there is a sort of like, you know, would this make Nate chuckle? Would this make Franny laugh? Like those kind of questions like pop up in, uh, or Franny cry, sorry, would it make, yeah. Um, yeah, I was about to say, no, not 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 chuckle. Franny cries when I read things. Uh, <laughs> like I've like felt away. Like if I read a poem that I thought somebody should cry and Franny didn't, I'd be like, so I work on that, cool. Uh, <laughs> um, other folks and voices, I think like they're like very real folks, you know, like I think, I think about my mom who reads my work. I think about my uncle who um, reads my work and like will call me and be like, you know, ask about every confusing line, you know, now what did you mean by this, you know, um, or like asking about the story behind the line. Um, I think about my friend Josh, right, um, who um, who doesn't read poetry, but you know, but I think about like, would this move him? I think about my friend Blair who hates poetry um, and asks, you know, and like it means a lot and Blair is like, you know, I hate poems, but I like that one, you know? And so like, I think, um, so those are, I think it's very real. There's also like, you know, I think um, at this stage, there's also like the babies um, that I think about um, just like younger writers and readers um, and how they will be affected um, um, or like what sort of information and like things that they glean from it. Um, but I also, I think like those, I have to like shut those voices out at some point too, right? Um, I think it helps, um, sometimes to keep the work um, and the question super personal and mine. Um, and then I think there are several stages in the process of editing something where, um, you know, where I need to open up to the room, right? Um, it's the difference, you know, sort of coming back to the stage, right? You know, like, I think like features still feel useful, right? Or reading still feel useful because like I work on the thing for my own and then it'll be like, oh, it's time to read this in front of somebody still. Um, and see what that is like so I can, you know, get information to bring it back to my own and crawl into a hole and be a mole man and work on poems. Why did I say that long thing? I don't know. Uh, that's what it feels like. Um, and I wonder, I, 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 I don't know if there's like a conversation that I'm having unless explicitly for that project with like ancestors and stuff like that or like, you know, influences, you know, I think Right now, like I'm working on changing, turning a poem into um, a stage production. And for like, there's like a certain album by Earth, Wind and Fire that's like really speaking to me. Um, you know, I think there are, I don't really know if I'm speaking across time backwards, right? I think I take these influences for what they are. I sample things, I do all this, um, but I feel like the echo that I'm more trying to listen to um, is between myself and the now um, or myself in the future. Um, and while the past, I think, holds information and influence, um, I don't know if like I'm trying to talk to Baldwin because he did, you know, but I might, <laughs> you know, like, um, and so I, I mean, you know, and I not to say that like, you know, like very much alive and, you know, I think like ancestor shit is real, but like, I think where the urgency for of the past lives in like how it is for me, um, how it is applicable to the now and the future. Um, and so I feel like I'm listening to the past, but I'm trying to talk forward um, in terms of like these conversations that I'm using in my head. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. 
you you said this thing, Denez, about um about finding features useful because because of information and you use this word information, which um which is a thing I've been thinking about, right? One of the things that strikes me about um I guess like spoken word or or just like the oral act of, of presenting poetry in this way is that the information you get from an audience, at least some of it is so immediate and that being a real feature of it. And so I'm curious for all of y'all, right? Cause you all, you know, have written and will continue to write across multiple genres. You also, you know, two of you have like hosted podcasts, um, and, you know, and, and like presented in all these different ways. What are, what's the difference? What do you find is the difference in in those audiences or the, the relationship that you maybe have with them as a creator? Um, yeah, is there a difference? Is it kind of just the same people just like, you know, they rock with me, so they rock with me? Or or do you feel a kind of, yeah, does that feel different, right? Do those relationships feel different? I think that they, um, I feel like, they feel different. Um, I think film feels different than poetry um, to me. Like, I think that there are folks who come to both of those things, like poetry and film, but there's a way in which that film kind of has a way of spreading faster and of there's a you know an accessibility that it has, like the moving image, the the kind of ability to like do it and or watch it engage with it and um not have to like slow down your day like you can kind of put something on in the background and so there's a way that it kind of it has like a it just has a way that it kind of moves a little faster um even though I think that there are especially with like um social media there's a way that small snippets of poetry too too you know um but there does feel like there is a different kind of, there's there's slightly different audiences um, or slightly different um, engagements with, with the genres, I think. And I, I think that's a good thing. Like, I think that um, something I've been thinking about is, you know how there's all, there's like sometimes this rhetoric of like retaining an audience or retaining a readership. Like, I just don't think that's true. Like, I'm like, I think that you put art out into the world and it vibrates with and resonates with who it resonates with. And being even as a creator, like less interested in like retaining an audience and being more interested in like, what is the project I deeply want to tell right now and who will it resonate with? And just trusting that more than, because I think that there is real damage that can be done when you're trying to write for someone without like an imagined someone without like an actual active engagement with them um, and without like allowing them to have their own agency to decide they're interested in it or not, you know? And so I think that there is, um, it's kind of that thing of like, you're just putting out things that you feel are important and whoever also feels those things are important, ma match that, you know? And just kind of having that feel to me, neutral is like more important than this kind of like commodification of like viewership or authorship or, you know, audience. And um, that's something that I've just kind of been sitting with, um, you know, and just being like every single project is it's at its own unique frequency and just allowing the truth of that rather than trying to um, make that anything other than what it is. I really agree with that. I feel like also poetry and film are vastly different audiences for the same reasons you just said, accessibility and um, and and the way, yeah, just the way people consume. I think that there's a different, I think there's a different reaction also to to film in part because it it is so collaborative. And so the person who's kind of positioned to like speak for the film is um, very different than maybe the person who wrote it or the or all of the people that had a hand in creating it. Um, and so I feel like there this this is the longest I've gone in a long time, maybe throughout my career as a writer where I haven't put something out. And I at first really struggled with this fear of of irrelevancy and and this fear of like, oh, if I'm not putting things out, who will remember me? Um, and now luckily there's a 
uh, it's it's actually quite nice to like form a really strong relationship with my work and and like you said Fatih like know that when I put it out there it will resonate with who it resonates with and it's nice to see what small crowd travels along with your work and it's nice to see familiar faces and names um but but it is it's also uh, really empowering to to just follow your work first and follow you know this the story and then and then see it find its way into the hands of new people and um and and also i think a lot about uh readers especially aging up i don't know about you all but i've seen some readers like grow up um people i met at shows years ago when they were middle school students are now like doing things on Instagram I don't want to see um it's like whoa uh like and and then becoming like incredible writers and and also like or just becoming you know their own people and 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 feeling more like peers in this way and um it's just wild how your work grows with people and and how um committing to being a writer is my friend Jeremy always says it's committing to growing in public and I think there's that, you know, uh, it's an, in that way, it's a really fascinating relationship to have with a readership. Like, wow, you've, I'm, I'm watching you grow, but you're also watching me like speak really um, sternly about things that then are subject to change. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm just a poet, so I don't got no. I well, I don't have to talk. That's I not true. I mean, I identify as a poet, and until Bitch, we all identify as a poet. <laughs> yeah, fair. But well, y'all niggas be doing the other shits, and you know, I have a screenplay. Is it gonna be on screen? No time fucking soon. So, uh, <laughs> um, so as a poet, as the as the as the as the most solo genre nigga here. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking about this relationship between audience, right? Uh, because I think what I was talking about before, right? This like the information you get from live performance, right? I think that also has like a like caveat or like an asterisk that like I'm probably I am very conservative. Um, definitely pivoting to a um, libertarian who sometimes votes Republican by the time I'm 50. Um. <laughs> But you know, I nationally in my local elections, I'll still vote liberal. Um, but you know, I got feelings about taxes. Uh, <laughs> Girl, uh, it's almost tax day. Everyone has feelings look, about taxes. I, look, and sometimes I'm like, hey, I love the fact that I can like possibly marry my boo one day, but he could definitely be my life partner for as long as we can keep pocket a little bit of this money. <laughs> um, <laughs> business decisions um no i'm just playing i i would never vote republican what was i talking about audience <laughs> um yeah you know i think like you know you only i don't know about y'all but like i feel like whether it's like happy sad cry whatever like there is a particular forethought that i'm putting into what work i'm bringing in front of an audience so like maybe i want them to be silent maybe i want them to be uncomfortable but it's still a type of work that I'm asking them to elicit a response if I'm bringing it in front of them. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is I can't trust that 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 audience for much, right? <laughs> like I can't actually bring them um, things that are not meant to, that are like more, maybe more confusing or more about like, uh, I don't know what the fuck I'm trying to say. I think what I'm trying to say is maybe like the way I bow to performance, like actually hinders um, how I can trust that audience to that relationship, right? Because I'm actually bowing to them a little bit in the curation of those poems. And so the only thing I can trust is that the poems that I've designed to elicit something, if they don't respond, then they're not doing what they do, right? But I think I can't trust that relationship across every project, especially as like y'all are talking about, like as you grow, right? Like. I feel a, a pressure. I'm glad, like, you know, even though like I write, I think like young people is a part of like the audience that's in my brain. 
I'm not like a YA author, right? I'm not like trying to be out here writing for kids because I think that does require you. One, it requires a particular type of intelligence. And I think there are people that do it really well and like can care and tender to that relationship of like doing literature and art for children. Um, but also like, you know, like I need the freedom to like write these like very 33 year old poems, right? Um, you know, and I, that's also a type of poem that like, I'm probably not gonna bring to the high school because like it will relate to the teachers more than them. Um, so like, you know, I like that, like because of my own curiosities, my own things, I become maybe an unreliable spokesperson for these audiences that maybe have attached themselves to me, right? And then like, you get to, you get to, I, I believe like, you know, you get to, ask your audience to ride with you, right? And I don't need everybody that likes me now to like every project, right? Like I have that relationship. Yeah, I love Beyonce, you know, I'm like in her top 5% of fans. Do I like every Beyonce album? No, uh, you know, but like when she releases a song that I don't like, am I like never again? No, you know, um, you know, so I like, you have to leave your artists freedom to do what they need. And I think that's a thing for an audience too, right? Like just cause like you're somebody's reader, um, and that could be a very intimate relationship. You know, I feel a deep relationship with folks that I read. Um, but I also have to remind myself that I can't feel like betrayed if they do something that I don't like. Um, right. Because that's the, like, that's the energy, right. That we're saying like that they, they had to get out at the time. Um, and you know, you also find new audiences. So I think that's the thing with readership too, right? Like, maybe there is somebody that wasn't going to be your fan from the start, but like your fourth, fifth book, you know, whatever new project you do, that hooks them in, right? Um, and at the end of the day, I think like it is just about the relationship between you and yourself as an artist, right? Like if you move yourself, if you like, you know, other people might be moved. If you excite yourself, other people might be excited. If you think it's crap, other people probably don't think it's crap. Um, so yeah, so I think like audiences, they can be everything, especially, it depends on the work too, right? Like sometimes we really do write shit for people, right? Um, and sometimes fuck them. Um, and so this is a very like, it's a wishy-washy relationship, you know? Um, and I think, sure, if audience, if you want that information, then I think that also becomes about mission, right? What am I trying to get people to do and react with, right? Maybe the work has a deeper choice, but some shit is just out there for folks to feel. You know, um, I don't know. And it's just information for the next project. If you try to write some healing and nobody comes to you and say that they were healed, back to the fucking drawing board, right? Uh, <laughs> um, right, you know, I mean, that's information, you know? Like, you know, if you wrote a beautiful poem about your grandma and everybody's like, that was a tight poem about a shoe, you need to go write about your grandma again, you know? Like, um, that was a very weird analogy. Um, but it happens, you know? Um, Sorry to all the grandmothers. <laughs> public apology to grandmothers everywhere. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about grandmas. I'm thinking about that one time a white poet put my grandma in a poem that they wrote and had my grandma walking across dead bodies um, to march and sing with Dr. Martin Luther King. And that was a real poem that got published on a real website. And let me tell you, the information I gave them back was not what they thought, what they were gonna get, right? And so that was like, <laughs> you know, so I guess too like, familiar. yeah, you know, um, too familiar, but also like, I don't know, maybe that's another thing is like audiences, like they'll fuck you up too. Um, and tell you like when you did a bad thing. I don't know, what are we talking about? I don't even remember what the original question was. I'm just not talking. <laughs> <laughs> excellent um wonderful so i think we're we're at about the time where it makes sense for us to transition uh to some audience questions and we have two if you want to if you have some other questions then uh uh please send them in and we'll try to get to as many as we can um but i'll, I'll start with this one uh that was one of the first ones to come in uh this, kyla writes I really believed in myself. I wrote until my arms gave out, but as time passed, I stopped. I'm having a hard time getting back into poetry. That one sweet, safe vulnerability feels off. What advice do you all have? Uh, 
Honestly, my, my, I think my advice is like not going to be, um, it's not going to be like the fun advice, but it's like, don't. <laughs> like, I think that if poetry is showing you that it's not the, it, don't force the thing. Like if it's telling you right now that it's like, the, something feels off, like it's not the mode, it's not the genre. Like, I think that's valuable information. And there are other genres that you can write in. There are other things that you can do. And if you continue to try to force something when, like, when there's a little bit of a burnout, that's going to make the burnout worse. And so like my advice would be to like replenish the well and to just, you know, I think about that from the artist way a lot is like, sometimes you're in really deep burnout and we've gone through a ridiculous lifetime, let alone the last few years. And so if you're like, I'm having a hard time being vulnerable, I'm having a hard time accessing vulnerability, I'm having a hard time accessing poetry, that's okay. Like you can be like, do you still love reading it? Do you still love being around it? Well, then that's information, right? If you're like, I can't even read this. Like, I don't like being around it at all. Like I would say like, find the other genre, like find the thing that allows you to do the thing. There's so many writers I know who, like I think about someone like Hanif who, you know, was a music journalist and then did poetry and essays and then went back to music journalism, you know, and, and kind of had like sworn off music journalism a little bit and then went back. You know, I think that there's, these genres, these, these things, they, they reveal themselves to you in ways that are really beautiful if you allow for that to be a listening versus you try to impose a will on top of it. So I would just say to try to think about like, if poetry is not offering you vulnerability, what is? Like follow the what is. And if you need to live a little, like if you're like, I need to cook, like I need to be with a lover, I need to whatever, I need to live a little bit in order to access that vulnerability, then go do that. You know, like there, there's so much that, there's so much poetry that is not just about writing and you can go and explore that in so many different ways. As I, I want to just like ping the artist way, which uh, Fati just mentioned, which is a phenomenal workbook that you can do. And I, I find it to be really um, recharging if you're trying to like heal your artistic practice. Um, so that might just be something to check out and see if it's for you. Um, I think I'm really maybe the word vulnerability is always really charged for me. Um, and so I'm wondering, I think I think uh, the advice of like going to where you can't do feel vulnerable is great. And I think also like, if you do wanna write poems, I guess my question is like, do they need to be vulnerable um, at this point in time? You know, like, um, is this about like, I guess if your writing was very personal or confessional um, in a way, there might be a reason why, you know, maybe you don't feel safe enough to do that, but do you feel safe enough to play in the genre, you know, can you write about persona from a, from, you know, in persona or using personification or like, you know, does it, does it have to be you, you know, can you, um, or does it have to make sense? Like, can you delight in the language for a little bit? Um, I think that was a turn for me at one point in time where, um, just in terms of poetry practice, where like, um, I think I had gone to poetry for such like cathartic or inspired reasons so often. Um, that I also needed to form a relationship with poetry, the language um, that didn't require some type of emotional um, or experiential toll for me to enter, right? Mm -hmm. That I was just sort of going in it for the delight of language and the to experiment with sound, um, to just like experiment with words and language, right? And that was very different than sort of having to be like, okay, now I have to say something about myself or I went through this thing and I wanna capture it um or you know i'm inspired and so i must say something right like um you know maybe this is a chance to like pivot and not like just ask yourself what is your relationship to the word um to the sentence and like does that bring you um a particular joy or presence or like good busyness um that you feel like is worth your time um and if it doesn't have to always just be you know you and your vulnerability I have nothing new to add. I agree with both. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, and we don't all have to sort of answer all of these questions. Um, I guess I'll move to another one so we can try to uh, at least get these last two in. Um, uh, Ty writes, 
my experience with writing and progressing as a poet has been a series of ascensions and plateaus. I'm curious what y'all have done in moments where your craft wasn't actively improving or growth felt more difficult. How were you intentional about challenging yourself or thinking differently? I think that's so natural. Like it's just such a natural thing to feel like you're trying and it's not really going anywhere or you're not growing in the way that you want to, or you feel like there's a lull going on. Like, I think, I think that is just so normal. And so I think the more that you can normalize that, the better, you know, and sometimes like you kind of need that stagnation to have the breakthrough and you kind of need that space of like, oh, it's not really working to then like, and it's really painful and it's really uncomfortable, but you, there's kind of nothing that you can do other than go through the pain and the uncomfortability of it. <laughs> like, it's the same thing, I think, with like any dark night of the soul, if that's like for you spiritually or anything, like you just, you just kind of got to go through it. And like, you have to listen, like you have to learn how to listen to the, to what it's telling you, you know, and and to know that that's not linear, to know that that's not, that's not just going to just, you know, reveal itself to you. And so I would say like, you could read, you could, you know, you can do things like the artist way, you can meditate. There's like, if you're like, there's other things that you can try to do to kind of allow for more opening for you, but sometimes you just got to go through it, you know, and you got to be able to hold the uncomfortability and like, you know, you cry, you call your friends, you're like, am I a failure? You do all of that. And you're told, no, it's fine. It's normal. And then you, you kind of just keep writing until you do feel like you grow, you know? And I, part of, part of listening, like you said, is, is I think that that's like a, a real opportunity to consume. I think reading is one of the most productive things you can do when you're not happy with your own writing. Um, also like, watching films you know going on on sort of on you know excursions to to learn about about elements of of history that you're fascinated and I mean it's like I think that it's an opportunity to welcome um the work of other people and and it doesn't even have to be from a place of like looking for inspiration I think it's just a good way to relieve yourself from of yourself for some time um, and that, that's whenever I just feel really like I'm not having a good writing day, I don't push myself through it, but I do push myself to then go and, um, especially read and watch the work of people who I feel are making work that I admire. Um, work, uh, that was all great. Also, hi, Ty. Ty was just texting me about the blankness of the walls in this Airbnb. Um, good to see you, Ty. Um, also, I want to talk to Ty a little personally because I know him. Um, and this goes out to anybody out there. I think you like, I think your answer is like literally in the first sentence. Like it is a series of ascensions and plateaus, right? And that, and that's great, right? Like, Ascensions and plateaus, no fucking like downfalls. Wow, what luck. Um, you know, like no, no, like, you know, decline. That sounds great. Um, and so I think you have to trust um, during those moments of plateau when maybe this anxiousness about not actively growing or improving comes out. I think you have to trust that they are seasons and that it is cyclical. And I think that is just a hard trust that you must learn as an artist. Um, that it's not always going to be about, you know, steady exponential growth um, and development, whether in the career or in the artistic practice, right? Um, I think we beat up on ourselves, there, especially, and I think it's real, but like, you know, especially when you start making money from your art, um, like there's this like grind culture, like you always have to be producing because producing literally means food. Um, and it, that makes, you know, the bad poems are not food, right? Or the bad art is not, you know, you know, it doesn't feel like it's gonna turn into your future. Um, but I think you have to trust that you will get back to it, right? I think writing is just difficult sometimes. I think bad art making is fodder for good art making. I think it is important to like still find ways to have a practice 
um, when you're not doing it right. And I think folks are saying all the things, right? You keep writing, you keep reading, you expose yourself to different types of art, you take it in, um, you keep experimenting, you know, you know, and that's the thing about experiments, right? Like they fail and fail and fail. And then you find the one thing that helps it fail a little less or makes it start succeeding, right? Um, so I think just having that trust that like, it will keep happening that you are a good artist and you are Thai, um, that, that, that you will find it, that you have the skills and experience to continue to discover it. Um, and, you know, I think we gotta be grateful that, you know, like in plateaus are sometimes that you need to like chill, um, right? Or that you need that energy to, that the, your creative energy needs to go towards mental health, needs to go towards food, like, you know, towards love life and, you know, um, and intimacy and friends, you know, that your creative energy needs to go towards money, that it needs to go towards whatever um, it may be. And so there are times that we're just not gonna be actively improving, right? Um, we're not, I don't know, like I trust, I have to trust that like, if I don't write a book for 10 years, I still can't, right? Um, and that the time in between was worth it. I have to trust that my growth does not wither when I'm not actively attending to it, right? Or my artistic spirit. Um, and I know that feels hard and it's been hard for me too. Um, but I think there is, I think the thinking differently, the thing I have to think differently about is the fact that it's a long game. And being a motherfucker that like often thought that I was gonna die young, I also have to like beat up my own mind and trust that like, unless I die, I will live. Um, and that continues to be true every day. And like, maybe I just have a long hope that like, I'm gonna get to see 70 or 80, right? And so I don't need everything to happen. You know, it's okay if 27 was about rest. Um, and if 34 was about attending to family and if 40 uh, was about, you know, changing, up, you know, whatever it may be, right? Because there will also be those years that I wrote that great thing, that I really worked hard on that, that I achieved this thing, that the award finally came, that whatever. Um, I have to trust the long journey of time in my life as an artist that allows every season not to be about discovery and winning, right? Because that's always happening, um, that discovery, that cataloging, right? Experience is useful. Um, but I, you have to, I think we have to learn to trust that it might always not be the easiest thing to chart. And that sometimes we're too, living too in the moment to be able to see that we're still climbing, right? Or for us, it feels plateauing. But if you can zoom out in the future and see where you've been, you know? It's kind of rough. It, it's beautiful. It's an art. I love that answer. Wonderful. Um, so this is this has been really great. Um, I thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Denez. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, this has really been a wonderful conversation. Um, I do want to. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time. I did try to answer some of the questions or just like offer a few thoughts for folks. Um, in the Q&A box, um, but I do want to bring up uh, Ariel <clears throat> uh, Mer Merillat, I wanna, sorry, I want to make sure I pronounce your name right, uh, Penn Faulkner's marketing coordinator uh, for Final Words, uh, but thank you so much to all of our participants and uh, to you all, the audience, and certainly to Penn Faulkner for putting this together. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Nate, for moderating that conversation so wonderfully. And thank you to our amazing poets for tonight's incredible performances and discussion. I mean, what a fun and insightful conversation. Like, thank you so much for bringing that energy, all of you. And a huge thanks to everyone in the audience who came out tonight and engaged with us. If you enjoyed tonight's program, we hope you'll consider making a donation to Penn Faulkner using the link we'll drop in the chat right now. Any amount you give will help us continue to provide high quality literary programs like tonight's literary conversation, as well as our education and awards programs year round. You can learn more about Penn Faulkner's work by visiting our website, pennfaulkner.org and by following us on social media. While this literary conversation is the last of our season, what a great way to go out. We still have our Penn Faulkner virtual awards ceremony coming up on May 2nd at 8 p.m. We'll be honoring our Penn Faulkner award winner, finalist, and literary champion, Oprah Winfrey. 
We'd love for you to join us at the ceremony. You can learn more about the event and purchase tickets on our website. And just thank you all again for being part of our literary family. And we hope to see you soon. Have a good night. Bye everyone.